Hello, I'm Kathleen Newman from Maine Historical Society. Thank you for joining us for another virtual program. It is January 21st, 2021, and this is uh, Acadians in Maine with Lise Peltier. Lise Peltier is the director of the Acadian Archives at the University of Maine, Fort Kent. She holds a master in uh, French from the University of Maine and a bachelor's in French and English from the Université de Montcalm campus de Edmonston. She has taught French, French literature and Acadian history, participated in the writing and translation of Acadian roots images from this of the St. John Valley and participated in three documentaries about Acadia of the lands and forests. She was on the executive board of the Congrès Mondial Acadien in 2014, the Acadian World Congress. And she is also the creator of the Acadian Treasure Trunk, a repository of over 100 items that educators can borrow from the archives to help them bring the history and culture of Acadia to the classroom. And I am going to be sharing some information with you folks if you would like to learn more about the Acadian Archives and how you can get in touch with the organization. Look for that uh, in the chat shortly. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with our audience uh, who I know join me in welcoming you, Lise. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And thank you to the Maine Historical Society for inviting me to be with you this evening. My presentation about is about Acadians and the statehood of Maine. And before getting into the subject proper, I'd like to take a moment to explain the words Acadian and Acadia. In 1524, Giovanni de Verrazzano traveled to the New World and explored the Atlantic coast. He found that the vegetation was lush, uh, the wildlife was abundant, and he likened the area to the mythical Greek garden of Eden, and so he called it Arkadzi. After a while, uh, the French decided that it was time to create a permanent trading post because they had been fishing and uh, hunting for furs or for animals with fur um, and trading with the First Nations. And they decided that it was a good step forward to create a permanent trading post. And so in 1604, Pierre Dugas, Sieur de Mont, Samuel de Champlain, and 79 crew members went to St. Croix Island um, and set up the habitation, the habitation, uh, which would be the permanent trading post. They um, sowed a garden and uh, set up the buildings. Unfortunately, winter came very, very early and it was very harsh. They had absolutely no cover, no shelter at all. Uh, from winter on the island, and so a great many of them died. Half the population died. And so in the spring in 1605, the survivors went across the Bay Francaise, or today the Bay of Fundy, and settled in Port Royal. Port Royal remained the capital or nucleus of Acadia for a great many years thereafter. Acadians are the French who migrated to uh, the area that is known as Acadia, the other French colony of France, the other one being New France. And Acadians settled in areas where the Atlantic Ocean came into the land. And so there were marshlands that were extremely salty. Acadians decided that that was going to be a good place to create farmland. And so they set about drying out those marshes. And the way they did that was by creating 
um, dikes or extremely high levees. And so the salt water would come in with the tides and um, completely inundate the marshlands. But the marshlands now had a way to uh, get rid of that water and the water would flow through a sluice at the end of which was a, a kind of a hinge door so that the salt water could escape. In two or three years, these salt marshes would be um, devoid of salt and would become extremely fertile uh, farming land. And so um, the idea of not only creating these um, arable lands, but also of building villages away from the hunting grounds of the Mi'kmaq uh, really helped foster a, and nurture a positive relationship with them. Between 1630 and 1755, uh, French people came to Akadzi. When they immigrated, they did not immigrate as a single individual, as we see most often today. A lot of French uh, immigrated with their families and often with entire communities. So when they arrived in Acadia, they already had a network of family, of relationships, and of people they could count on to create a, a community in this new settlement. And it was very necessary because the work of creating uh, the diking systems uh, to dry out the marshlands was extremely hard. It was very, very difficult um, work to do, but it reaped rewards. And so in time, because Acadians relied on their own ingenuity, they became very independent. Regardless of who was in authority, Acadians elected representatives who would carry their voices to the authorities or to town councils. You can see from this map that Acadians settled in pockets where the Atlantic Ocean through the Bay of Fundy came into the lands. That is where uh, they built the, the diking systems. And in fact, the diking systems were so well done that they are still in existence and still in operation. In fact, UNESCO uh, deemed that the Grand Prix marshlands, um, the system, the Aboitou system, um, is now a World Heritage Site since 2012. So because, um, because Acadians were situated in kind of in isolation from other populations, uh, their numbers increased dramatically. There were no endemic diseases. The birth rate was high and the infant mortality was low. At 1755, the Acadian population is approximately 18,500. Acadians had enjoyed a very good life in their new settlement to the point where not only were they independent, but they felt they were a distinct society from the one they left behind in France. And so they started calling themselves Acadians in, in a way to separate themselves from their motherland and to recognize that they indeed had a different identity and they embraced it. Whoever was in charge, either the French or the English, and the colony changed hands within a period of 100 years, the colony of Acadia changed hands seven times. It really didn't matter to Acadians who the authority was, who was governing their colony. They wanted to farm. They were also merchants. They traded and sold goods 
to Europe and to the British colonies. Um, their farms helped sustain the population of the British colonies, as well as uh, that of Acadia. And so they were interested in continuing this lifestyle and in ensuring that their lands were still profitable and the land would go to the generation after them. They were not interested in going to war. They were not interested in going to war against the British and they were not interested in going to war against the French or the Mi'kmaq. So when the British decided that they were going to ask the French to sign an oath of unconditional allegiance, Acadians refused. They declared themselves neutral and explained that the British had nothing to fear. And really the British did not have anything to fear. Acadians were civilians. They were not soldiers and they were not there to make war. However, what was going on at the same time that the population in Acadia was growing rapidly, the rate of immigration to the British colonies exploded. And there were tens of thousands of people coming in every year. It got to the point where the, the um, British governors of Massachusetts and of uh, Nova Scotia started asking, well, what shall we do? How can we sustain them? Um, there is not enough employment for the newcomers. The forests are not cut. We do not have housing. We do not have enough food. Wouldn't it be a good idea if Acadians were no longer on their lands and we could give these fertile lands to good British subjects? And so that idea uh, became a reality. Um, and through a proclamation, this was announced to the Acadians. And this is what the proclamation read, a, a small portion of it. Your lands and tenements, cattle of all kinds and livestock of all sorts are forfeited to the crown with all of your effects, saving your money and household goods and you yourselves to be removed from this province. This is what was done in every village of Acadians. Acadian men were rounded up in the church waiting for the ships to come pick them up. When they reunited with their families, they waited on the shore until the ships were there. There might have been 30 ships um, in the bay, uh, the bay of Fundy. And then as they started boarding, the families were separated. Acadians didn't know where they were going. When they saw their children and their husbands and sons and other community members leave to board other ships, they thought they were all going to the same place. But that was not the plan. The plan was to dissipate the Acadians as much as possible. And so every ship had a different destination, which Acadians did not know about. Some families were separated on the shore. Once on the ships, Acadians looked back while British soldiers set fire to the buildings, their homes, their church, their outbuildings, uh, and destroyed the crops while the livestock were confiscated. This was uh, to destroy any hope Acadians would have of coming back because the message was, you have nothing to come back to. Acadians call this time in their lives the great upheaval, le grand dérangement. It lasted from 1755 to 1763. The deportation was not 
just one expulsion and embarkment into exile. It lasted eight years. The British first deported Acadians to the 13 colonies to the south. After 1758, they sent more Acadians to Britain and France. In all of the 18,500 Acadians in the region, approximately 11,500 Acadians were deported. Half of Acadians removed from their homes died. Approximately 2,600 escaped deportation. When I say escaped deportation, it doesn't mean that they continued living um, a healthy and prosperous life elsewhere. They escaped to the woods. They escaped and sometimes lived with Mi'kmaq families. Mi'kmaq families did not have enough to sustain a, a number of additional people. Those who escaped the deportation um, had very, very hard lives ahead of them. Some managed to reach the um, Bay of Chaleur area or the Chaleur Bay area, and some reached the lower St. Lawrence area of Quebec. This is a map that outlines where Acadians were shipped. So you can see, um, let's look at 1755. You have um, a, a big purple arrow going from Nova Scotia to uh, the British colonies to the south, the 13 colonies. And then you have a number of blue arrows uh, that go from Nova Scotia to either prisons in England or to France. From there, after 1763, a number of Acadians came back, decided to come back, and they either went to Newfoundland or they went to Louisiana by way of trying to come back to Acadia because they had heard that a great many Acadians had decided to go to Louisiana. Acadians were never deported to Louisiana. And one thing I want to state that I, I believe is quite important and was not very well known. Um, the Yale professor, John Mac Farragher, actually elucidated this in his book, A Great and Noble Scheme. The British authorities, that is the governments in place between Massachusetts and Nova Scotia, did not have enough soldiers to carry on uh, the massive deportations and removal of Acadians. And so they enlisted the help of Americans or Yankees to help them out. And so every expedition had maybe up to 2,000 um, Americans uh, who helped the British carry out this plan. This plan of removal and expulsion of Acadians constitutes um, an ethnic cleansing because the intention was to destroy the culture and the people. And it was to create enough tragedy that Acadians would not seek to reconstitute their people, their culture, their identity. At the end of 1763, 1763, is the year where France and England sign a peace treaty and the uh, Acadian colony is ceded to England uh, forever. So at the end of 1763, we have Acadians living in the British colonies. We have Acadians living in the lower St. John River in England in Quebec, in the Baie de Chaleur, in Louisiana, France, Prince Edward Island. And the total is 12,660. Acadians are, are extremely um, resilient and 
hopeful. And so they were so attached to their homeland that they decided to return. In fact, one of, or probably the best known Acadian writer, her name is Antonine Maillet. She wrote a book which won um, a very prestigious literary award, and it is called Pélagie, The Return to Acadia. In the book, she writes about families who walked along the Atlantic coast to return to the Acadia that they had loved so much, only to find that all their lands had been given to New England planters. Actually, the British did start giving those lands vacated by the Acadians to the New England planters started in 1760. When Acadians come back to Acadia, they know that England now rules, and so they are asked to sign or pledge an oath of allegiance without renouncing their religion, but they are told that they can only settle in certain areas of Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Cape Breton Island. They cannot settle more than 10 families at a time. So here again, although uh, the British were to letting them settle again in Acadia, they were limiting the opportunity for families to reconstitute into a nation. Acadians who had fled the deportation and had settled in the lower uh, St. Lawrence River area, such as the towns you see, Rivière Well, Camourasca, Rivière du Loup, Ile Verte, they started coming back and a great number of them settled in the lower St. John River area of St. Anne. They were hoping to build a permanent Acadian settlement there and that uh, they enjoyed uh, their life there. They started farming and they traded. They uh, traded with uh, British merchants and they also traded with the British colonies to the south. And um, they were hoping that they would reconnect with their Acadian families. What happened then was that in 1783, at the end of the Revolutionary War uh, with the United States, a new independent nation, a number of loyalists, loyalist soldiers and their families who had fought against the Americans in the recent war, decided that they were not returning to England, that they wanted to go and settle in Canada. 40,000 of them went to Canada in 1783, 1784, 12,000 of them landed the upper St. John River area and came to live close to the Acadian village. Now, when Acadians realized this, their hopes of getting a French Catholic priest were dashed. They never thought they would be able to get a, a priest, uh, a Catholic priest with so many Protestants uh, around them. Another reason they wanted to leave was because the newcomers wanted land and not only land, but they would deplete the forest to build their homes, build their commissars. And since we're talking about a great number of people, Acadians feared that their hunting grounds, that is, that was part of their economy, and the lands that they were hoping to become owners of, this was not going to be possible. And it was not going to be possible for them as well to transfer these lands to their children. And so you have um, a great number of reasons for Acadians 
um, to want to move elsewhere and maybe have their own community. And the newcomers were not friendly to Acadians. There were some skirmishes. Um, in some cases, uh, the loyalists came in and said, you don't belong here. You do not own these lands. We are, we are taking over. Um, and after it did not take a very long time for Acadians to decide that they needed to, to leave. And so they petitioned uh, the government, the new government of New Brunswick, 1784, for lands in the Madawaska territory. That area was very well known to them because they had journeyed up the rivers up to the St. Lawrence River, and they knew that there were vast virgin forests in that area. And there was the, the St. John River was um, extremely healthy, and they could probably have a, a new life there and establish a new permanent settlement of Acadians. This is a map of the St. John River uh, Valley. So the St. John River Valley starts at the Grand Falls and goes westward and northward equally on both sides of the St. John River. And so it meanders for about 70 miles up to where the St. Francis River um, joins the St. John. So you have three entities in that single area. Um, and it's going to be important in a little while when we talk about the Abrustic War. So if you look up towards the left-hand corner of the map, you will see an area that's called Bow Lake. And it is an international boundary between Quebec, New Brunswick, and Maine. So it's, it's, I think it's unique um, in that respect. So here is the concession. Um, this is the grant map of 17, um, 1790, which was awarded to Acadians who settled in the St. John Valley. The lots of land are divided into long lots or spaghetti lots um, as they are in Quebec. And this was also the British way of um, cutting up lots. Everyone had access to the river and then they had access to uh, wooded areas and they have plenty of uh, land to build uh, a farm as well. It was not unusual when the first families came to the area for one son to settle on one side of the river and another son to settle right across from his brother, let's say. The Acadians um, living in the St. John Valley area, let it be known that, uh, that there, there was ample land and good living in the area. And so a great many of their relatives joined them. Uh, they were originally from Acadia and there were also some French Canadians from Quebec. And in time, um, the population grew very quickly. This is not to say that everything was rosy um, and they did not had, have hardships. They, did have hardships. Uh, they even have a, a great famine. And, um, but they sustained and um, they, um, they managed to uh, survive. And then the area where they were, they were confident that this area was in British territory. The problem after Maine became a state was that the Treaty of 1783 referred to the highlands as the border. So on this map, the yellow line 
represents the British claim. The British claimed that the Highlands were in the area of Mars Hill, while the United States or Maine claimed that the Highlands were actually in the Temiskwata Lake area, the red line. So eventually, so for a long time, there was no border. There was not a delineated border after 1820. So the northern border was, um, was kind of in limbo. And I believe that's how Bangor became known as Northern Maine, uh, because the rest of it was, well, there weren't, first of all, there wasn't a heavy population in that area. Um, and because it was in flux for such a long time, it wasn't until 1842 that the border was determined. So Maine and uh, Maine and the United States and England both had claims. Both wanted access to the forests uh, because there were giant white pines. The white pines served in the shipping industry to create masts. And then the lumber industry also started. And so it was essential to have the water ways to float uh, the logs and timber to market either the Atlantic Ocean or to Boston. New Brunswick claim of uh, the also the vast forests and access to the mail route between Nova Scotia and Quebec for mail and goods. It was also um, um, it, it was also a good military strategy. So tensions rose in the territory of the disputed border um, and the actions escalated on one part and the other. Both the United States and Canada made censuses um, trying to determine how many people lived on in the territory, the disputed territory. There was illegal timber cutting on both sides. In 1827, an American by the name of John Baker, who had settled on the Miriam Tsikuk, later to be called Baker Brook, he had always felt that he was standing in American, on American soil. And so in 1827, on the 4th of July, he had a party, um, an Independence Day party, where other American um, residents of the area um, declaring that it was uh, an American soil. Uh, Maine uh, builds Holton Barracks and the Military Road in 1831 creates the town of Madawaska. Both Maine and New Brunswick sent armed troops to the area. Um, there are seven forts constructed in the disputed area. And finally, in 1839, there is a truce. The fort that you see on the upper left-hand corner is the fort of Fort Kent. It is the original building built in 18. 39 um, and it is still standing. It is the only original one still standing. On the uh, at the lower left hand uh, corner, you that is the um, uh, that is the Fort Ingle in Cabano and it is on the Timisquata uh, Lake. It is absolutely beautiful. It is reconstructed. Uh, but they have live reenactments every summer. Um, on the top right hand corner, you find the Fort of Petitso or Little Falls, situated in Edmonston, New Brunswick. That is a British fort, as well as the Fort Ingle. And at the bottom right hand corner is the reconstructed Fort Fairfield Fort. 
This is the flag that John Baker um, hoisted on July 4th, 1827. It's very ironic because eventually, as we know, the land where he was farming and had set up a mill um, became or remained in New Brunswick, therefore um, a, a British entity. And this flag is now the flag of the Republic of Madawaska. And it flies um, at the town office of Edmonston, New Brunswick. So John Baker, who was um, a very staunch American, died in the area and was buried in Bakerbrook. Years later, his daughter had his remains unearthed and then he was buried in Fort Fairfield. So these are the terms of the Webster Ashburton Treaty, which was signed on August 9, 1842. The St. John River becomes an, the international boundary and it's not in the middle of the river. The boundary is wherever there is the deepest current um, or the channel, the Chennai. All the Acadian villages on the south shore of the river were ceded to the United States. Uh, Maine was going to be reimbursed for its military expenses. England cedes 17,500 kilometers, square kilometers and 2,000 Acadian subjects and obtains 12,530 square kilometers of land. And there is free navigation for both American and British um, exploiters of the forests. In the aftermath of the Border Treaty, because there had been a truce and there had been a dispute, the people who were farming did not have access to deeds of lands. And so it took a long time for them to receive uh, the, the deed of their land. Unfortunately for the Acadian population, of the Madawaska Territory, uh, which the entire territory at one point was 100% French and Catholic. And so the Webster-Ashburton Treaty actually divided uh, one people into two countries. And the two countries, their institutions, their language, um, their policies were not the same. The land stretch on either side of the St. John in Canada and in the US. Towns and churches were therefore restricted to their side of the river. Grand Riviere became Van Buren and St. Leonard. And all the lands had to be resurveyed um, in order to issue land deeds. Beatrice Craig, who wrote the history of the St. John Valley, her book is called The Land in Between. After 1842, both halves of the valley gained public institutions, that is postal and education, designed to firmly integrate them into the political entities to which they belonged. These measures, however, largely failed. American Madawaska was not neglected. It was rather micromanaged when left to its own devices, the Acadians opened French schools using catechism as a primer. But since parents had to pay full tuition, which limited the number of students, this resulted in a high rate of illiteracy. So adding to this situation, between 1830 and 1930, approximately 1 million French Canadians immigrated to Maine. So we're going to look at the context, the historical context of the state of Maine at this time. So the French Canadians were going to textile mills, to tanneries, to shoe manufacturing plants. 
the authorities or Protestants in places of government and employment felt threatened by the sheer number of newcomers uh, since they were Catholic and they were French. And they also resisted assimilation because they came to find employment in order to make enough money to go back home. And so they retained uh, their, their um, connections with the province from which they came and they went to visit very often. Now it turned out that not many of them uh, went back to Quebec to stay there after having worked in Maine for a while. Uh, most of them ended up staying. But while they were in Maine, they created little Canadas. Uh, they associated with people like themselves. They tried to get Catholic uh, French schools. Um, they were feared because their numbers could upset the Protestants in authority. So we start with the um, uh, know nothings and then we progress to the KKK. In Maine, the KKK became visible not because it was against the number of Blacks in Maine, because there weren't that many Blacks in Maine. The KKK in Maine was there to uh, give support to the Protestants who did not want uh, French Catholics in their midst. This is a picture of the first daylight parade in Milo, Maine in 1923. At the, its height, the number of KKK members in Maine could have reached 150,000 members. In addition to this, um, the KKK, on April 1st, 1919, Maine adopted uh, the anti-French law, that is no language other than English uh, could be used to transmit education. Uh, French was therefore seen as a this new law. There was a message to uh, French schools in the upper St. John Valley um, and elsewhere. And the message was, if your students are caught speaking French, um, you run the risk of losing the, your state funding. And faced with that prospect, a number of teachers uh, really tried very hard to stop their children from speaking French, which was really tragic because French was their only language. Um, most of them came to school without knowing English at all, having spoken only French. So in addition uh, to corporal punishments, there was ridicule, there was prejudice, uh, there was shaming, there was discrimination, and these behaviors were still present in the 1990s um, in the schools in Fort Kent at least. And people who went through this period um, talk about a traumatic experience, um, being shamed because they spoke French, um, being shamed because when they learned English, they could not speak it very well. And so sometimes they didn't know who they were supposed to be. They weren't allowed to use their language. They were told that it was, it was a bastardized um, version of French because it was not the way French was spoken in Paris, let's say. It was a language that had worked. It was a language of the people. It was, a lang it was an active language, um, a language that was very alive and used in all elements of society, in church, in business, in commerce, etc. So here they were, these young children, 
in school, uh, where of course, uh, remembering how we were in, in school and I, at a young age, nobody knows any better than the teachers. And they were being told um, that their language could not be used or didn't matter or was inferior. This is another photograph um, of the KKK gathering in Portland. The KKK were so strong in Maine that uh, they helped elect a, a governor, Ralph Owen Brewster, and a very popular uh, person, Farnsworth, um, was a, um, a great speaker of the KKK. In the St. John Valley, French was very much still the language of business, the language of families, the language in church. And so in the local newspapers, and the newspaper was French, um, there was a great sale. And then if you go down um, the second one, you'll see that in the middle, you'll see that there is an incursion of English the our our uh, stock is up to date but everything else is in french these are some of the ways where the entire saint john valley on both sides continues to be a borderland first you have uh, one people divided into into two different countries and two different state entities, the province of New Brunswick and the state of Maine. In the northwestern section of the province of New Brunswick is 100% francophone. So all French and the culture is uh, very close to Quebec and Europe. Whereas in Maine, of course, the language and the institutions are totally different and the language of commerce is English. However, in the St. John Valley, uh, French continued to dominate uh, for a number of years. And in fact, there were other collaborations that are highly visible. The most uh, visible one is the Fraser Paper Mill that operated part of its um, production or manufactured, it manufactured pulp in Edmonston. And the pulp was um, shipped to Madawaska, where it was transformed into paper. There was never any duty there, but if you look at the second, um, uh, the second bridge, that is where the, the pulp came in. So that was collaboration and it was ongoing and it still is ongoing. These are other um, examples of collaboration between the two countries. Um, if you go to the Aroostook Valley Country Club, what, there's a golf course there. The Stars and Stripes and Maple Leaf fly side by side. So the golf course uh, the holds one and two, um, and you literally can hit it out of the country. It, was, it is where the US and Canada international boundary divides the 18 hole golf course and the clubhouse. Um, they make a joke and they say that the golf, the, the golf course uh, was created at the turn of the 20th century. And when um, the prohibition came along, they built the country, the country club in New Brunswick because it was not dry there. <laughs> so golfers could have a drink by stepping into another country. There are other collaborations going on um, in terms of festivals or um, international events such as the Muskie Derby, uh, the Can-Am dog sled races, um, the, the international snowmobile races. Um, and at the bottom, you have a group of people who are the core leaders, that is um, the leaders in economic development. They are made up of a group of international um, representatives of Northwestern New Brunswick, the St. John Valley, Maine, and the County of Timiskwara. And they're all working together to try to 
uh, create business opportunities and tourism opportunities as well uh, by going through hurdles or um, trying to erase the hurdles between the states, between the provinces, and between the countries of Canada and the United States. Of course, the, what Acadians um, used to say uh, when uh, faced with the prospect of um, becoming integrated into the life of Americans, uh, they would say, do whatever you want, which was pretty much their attitude all along. And if we don't like it, we'll just cross the bridge <laughs> and get what we want in Canada. But eventually, uh, the separation takes its toll. So how do we foster cultural and linguistic identity? Uh, there used to exist a reciprocity between the US and Canada that created such a thing as dual citizenship. Um, so before, uh, before there was uh, a hospital in Edmonston, New Brunswick, everyone on the Canadian side was born at the hospital in Eagle Lake or uh, Fort Kent. All of them were automatically U.S. citizens. When they came back to Canada, they were automatically Canadian citizens. Today, um, those people have still hold citizenship to those two countries. Now, on the American side, um, people from Frenchville to Van Buren were born in Edmonston. They were Canadian citizens by being born there, and then they crossed into the United States and they were American citizens. So this was a reciprocity that both countries understood about being people and respecting each other and trying to give each other a break. That ended in the late 1990s. There were mixed marriages, that is, um, people from the two countries married. Uh, there were quite a few of them, and so that created relatives on both sides there were French newspapers, radio and TV stations, masses and cultural events which helped the St. John Valley um, Acadians keep their language and their culture alive. There was employment, hockey teams, choirs, um, consuming of goods, going into different restaurants, giving, going into stores, and of course, as I mentioned, the leaders of the Economic Development Committee. The key to maintaining our language and culture resides in having French programs in all the elementary schools of the St. John Valley. Unfortunately, there does not exist one single French program in any of the elementary schools of the St. John Valley. We could also use Acadian cuisine and culture to drive economic development. And we need to increase interactions with French New Brunswick and Quebec. We do have celebrations. We celebrate August 15th, which is Acadian Day. And we saw, we were witness to a renewal of Acadian pride during the Acadian Congress, the Acadian World Congress, of 2014, it was really quite heartwarming. This huge parade happened in Madawaska, Maine. We have a couple of organizations um, that are trying to revive uh, French uh, language. Uh, there's the French Club, there's the Maine Acadian Heritage Council, which does a lot towards preservation of Acadian traditions. And there's, of course, the Acadian archives. So we are all, as our ancestors were, we are all very hopeful for the future. Um, and we hope that our language and our identity will be respected enough and um, to, to be given an, a chance to continue flourishing. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Reese. Uh, that was really informative and really interesting. Um, I uh, want to get to some of our questions uh, from the audience. Um, let's see. Uh, so Neil is asking, uh, it was my impression that the St. Croix River has three branches and that was part of the border problem, um, which do you yes. see basis for the border? It was a part of the problem, although the, it, they, they resolved that it was another St. Croix uh, River that they were talking about. And so that was not the determining factor of the dispute or the confusion. Um, the word that led to a lot of confusion was highlands. Thank you. Um, more questions. Um, Linda asks, what is the difference between uh, Acadia and Arcadia? Um, Arcadia is a, is a mythical, uh, I'm not sure. It's Acadia. Um, Arcadia is the uh, mythical Greek Eden. So it, it does not exist as a place. Whereas um, Acadie is uh, the homeland of the French who settled in that colony. Thank you. Andrew asks, were some British colonies more accepting of the Acadian refugees than others? For instance, would the Catholic population in Maryland have aided Acadians more sympathetically due to a shared faith? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. You, you are correct in that. Um, while I don't have extensive uh, knowledge of separate places, I know that uh, Maryland was kinder to Acadians uh, than other, uh, other colonies. Some colonies, most colonies were not expecting them at all. Um, and a lot of colonies, because it was, uh, there was such an, an, an an influx of newcomers, they hardly had enough to sustain themselves. Um, and so it, it was extremely hard. Um, some colonies, I believe uh, Virginia, uh, it did not even let the Acadians uh, disembark. Uh, they left them on the ship, um, awaiting another ship that would take them to England, uh, to the prisons of England. Um, so yes, and, and you know, I mean, we're talking about eight years. So eight years during, during which time the Acadian population, um, you know, went to uh, these, the British colonies, but also were sent elsewhere. Thank you. Let's see, um, other questions. Robert asks, um, you mentioned the KKK in the 20s um, and some of the, the prejudice and discrimination that this community faced. Um, is this uh, still an issue today? Can you speak to how much prejudice there may be towards Acadians uh, today, in, uh, whether it's in Maine or Canada or elsewhere? Is this, is this still a struggle? Um, there are different, um, a, a different different ways, I guess, uh, different perceptions. Um, in Canada, um, and I'm thinking of uh, the maritime provinces, it, it is not unusual to have two different history curriculum. Um, and, and so the, the Francophone schools will teach about Acadian history, but the Anglophone schools won't necessarily teach about Acadian history. I find that completely insane because history is history. You're not supposed to pick and choose. However, we do the same thing in Maine. Um, Maine has approximately 40% of its population that has Franco-American roots or French Canadian roots. They're, and we don't teach the history of Franco-Americans or Acadians. So why is that? Um, and it's, it is, it's prejudice. It's this belief that there is one winning authority 
and we must do everything um, to elevate them. And so if we elevate them, then all the other entities or people are all below. Um, and it's extremely unfortunate. I know um, Susan Brooks is asking, um, can you recommend any reading on this topic? I know I've started sharing some books that are available at the uh, Maine Historical Society Museum store. That website is mainhistorystore.com and I'm sharing links to some of the books uh, that I know we carry. Um, but at least you may have some uh, good recommendations of your own. Um, if you're interested in um, a, the general story or history of Acadians, I would definitely recommend John Mac Farriger, A Great and Noble Scheme. If you're interested in um, Acadian development of identity, I recommend Naomi Griffiths. Uh, she's done extensive work. There are also great, great um, history texts uh, from francophone writers like Ronnie Gilles Leblanc, uh, Maurice Basque, Jean Daigle. I could send you a list and then um, if, if you wanted to, you could uh, disseminate that information. You know, a lot of, yes, please um, share that with us and uh, anybody, anyone who has um, more questions um, about this that, that we may not get to this evening or just questions about our other programs, uh, feel free to email me at k-n-e-u-m-a-n-n at mainhistory.org and I'll get those um, resources that Lise uh, shares with me. I'm happy to pass them on to you. Um, a lot of people are asking too or have questions about their own Acadian ancestors or heritage. Um, where would you recommend they go to do some research? Um, actually come to just write the Acadian archives. Uh, we do, we uh, do family trees, we do genealogy, and we do this uh, free of charge. It's a service uh, that, uh, this is something that we really like to do. Everybody who has a French name, <laughs> we can usually go um, well to France in the 16 or 1500s. Um, so that's exciting. It, once in a while, uh, we can't find them. Another great resource in Acadian genealogy, uh, Lucie Leblanc Constantino. Um, she has a website and uh, she relies heavily on Stephen White. He is at the uh, Center for Acadian Studies at the University of Moncton. Um, so yeah, so feel free to uh, write to us and uh, we'll let you know what kind of information uh, we need to get going and, uh, and we'll let you know what, what we find. Thank you. Um, Janet uh, is asking uh, two interesting questions. Um, if we assume that uh, French Canadians are, are different from Acadians, um, what was their heritage? Uh, French Canadians? Yeah, how are they different? Um, they, different it, communities, I guess. How are they different from Acadians? Um, it used, it was believed in the past that French Canadians and Acadians came from completely different areas of France. Um, and today we uh, we understand that that might not necessarily be the case. What did happen though is once they were in the New World, uh, the colony of New France and the colony of Acadia uh, developed independently from each other um, and went through completely different histories. Um, and even the way um, that French Canadians lived um, in New France was vastly different from the way Acadians lived. Acadians survived the first years um, by making relationships, uh, trading relationships first and foremost with the Mi'kmaq and learning their language, learning their, uh, their, their foods and their medicines and um, by respecting, by respecting their, uh, their places, their hunting places and et cetera, 
Uh, whereas in New France, it was not necessarily like that. Um, they might not have made friendships as easily as Acadians did. And that's just one aspect of life in New France. The other question she's asking is that uh, she's always heard, read, learned that most of the Acadians were deported to New Orleans, to, to Louisiana. Uh, do you know why that idea is perpetuated? Because we learned tonight um, from you that first they're sent to back, they're sent to Europe, I should right. say, and then um, some of them make their way to right. Louisiana. Well, actually, um, they were never deported to Louisiana. Um, I, th I think probably because they make the connection uh, between uh, Acadians or Cadiens and Acadians, and so they think, well, they went from there directly to Louisiana. There's only one group that I know of uh, that went directly to Louisiana, um, and that was from, and it was after the Treaty of Paris, after 1763, so they were not deported to Louisiana. They went there of their own. They went there on their own. Uh, some went to Acadians, chartered a ship and they went to um, Santa Domingo and Haiti and their, uh, their people did not do very well. They did not, um, they did not, the, the climate was not really good to them and uh, then they developed diseases and a lot of them decided to go to Louisiana which was a Catholic uh, colony, a Spanish colony at the time and they would give them, the, the government would give them enough to uh, keep them sustained for a year. And so when they reached Louisiana and they settled in, they sent word, don't ask me how they did it, but it, it's obvious uh, that they kept in touch with the people who were in France. And they let them know that there were a number of them going to Louisiana and quite a few thousand Acadians uh, in France joined them in Louisiana. Well, thank you so much. Um, this You've just been such a, a wealth of information on this topic. Uh, and I want to thank everyone uh, again for joining us this, this evening and for your thoughtful questions. Um, remember, if you have um, uh, more questions uh, that we didn't have a, a chance to speak to, um, feel free to email me. Um, my email is there in the chat. Um, and don't forget to, to uh, visit the Acadian archives um, at www.umfk.edu forward slash archives forward slash. You can email them at acadian at maine.edu. Uh, don't forget to, uh, to see the recording of this program and our other programs about our events, how to become a member, how to visit Maine Historical Society and do research, visit mainehistory.org. Uh, Lise, thank you again so much uh, for spending the evening with us. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to say or uh, any other resources that you'd like to remind us of or, or share with us before you go? Um, I think you mentioned, Kathleen, at the beginning, you mentioned that I created a, a, a trunk uh, it's a treasure chest and um, stay tuned because that will be um, launched quite soon and I'm very, very excited about it. Fantastic. Well, thank you again uh, very much and uh, I hope we'll see everybody back here soon uh, for another virtual program from Maine Historical Society.